Welcome, everyone. My name is Gary Gordon, and I'm the founder of What Should I Be? And we are here today with Jennifer Dempsey, who's a hairstylist. And I would like to start off letting uh, Jennifer tell us a little bit about what she does, where she works, um, and just some of the background behind her becoming a hairstylist. And then we'll move into some further questions. So why don't you start us off, Jen? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Dempsey. I work in Seaburn, New Jersey at a salon called Derek Michael Kalan. Um, I've been a hairdresser for about five years and within that five years I've um, accomplished a lot. I always knew that I wanted to be a hairdresser so it was the exact move for me right after high school. I went to Cosmic Cosmic School for a year and I've never stopped since. So education. I'm all about education. So mostly of what we're going to talk about or what my answers are going to have to do with is all about education. And that's really the foundation of how I got where I am today in a short period of time is continuing education. So Jennifer, um, when you say you always wanted to be a hairstylist, um, were you one of those young girls who at the age of seven or eight was cutting their, you know, friend's hair or what, when, how did you know? Exactly. Really? Cutting Barbie's hair off, making them all <laughs> bald, actually. <laughs> That's very I always, Whenever I talk to younger girls, you know, you have to have that. You kind of have to always have that want to be a hairdresser from a young age to really make it. Because unless you're going to be a celebrity hairdresser or, you know, really up there doing, working with celebrities or in Hollywood charging $1,200 for a haircut, you know, we're never going to get rich overnight off being a hairdresser. So if the love and the passion isn't behind it, then you're just going to find yourself unhappy. Did you know anyone when you were, let's say, back in high school or before that was a hairstylist that kind of like was a role model of any way in that work? Yes. Well, my hairdresser, I started getting my hair done when I was 13 as soon as my mom let me get it done. Everyone used to call me Skittles because I would have red and blonde and black hair in my all the time, all crazy different colors. And I thought she was a rock star. I looked up to my hairdresser. She had, you know, long, dark hair, all these tattoos. And I just loved going to the salon and being around her and being in that environment and loved just having conversations with her. I really thought that she was like a rock star. So I wanted to be just like her. So she was... When I was thinking about going into hair school, she definitely was someone that I leaned on going into that field. Cool. What type of personality, if that, and, and does it really play a role, uh, should someone maybe possess or have if they want to become a hairstylist? Like, is it, is it important to be outgoing? Or can you be an introvert and still be very successful? I mean, do any of those type of things really matter, in your opinion, from what you've seen? In my opinion, it does. I mean, I think if you talk to other people, it might not matter as much. But in my personal opinion, I do think that it matters. You know, I always say personality is what people find coming back. You can go and get a good haircut anywhere. You can go and get exactly the color that you imagine anywhere, but it's that personality that keeps people coming back, that personal bond that you share with people. Um, and then you end up starting doing their two-year-old and, and then now they're four and you've walked through divorces and marriages and having babies with, with your clients and they start to become more like a family and you have a special bond. So the more outgoing that you are, and more open, I believe, you know, I believe whatever kind of hairdresser you are, whatever kind of personality you have, that's who you attract to you. So I'm very outgoing, kind of loud. I sing and dance around the salon and have a good time. And those are kind of the clients that I have too that are kind of outgoing, you know, getting a blowout on Saturday because they're going out Saturday night. So in my opinion, you know, that's how I feel. Have you met any hairstylists or work with any that maybe are of a different type of personality than you maybe they're more reserved have you worked with anybody like that um in my personal salon i feel like everyone kind of has a special flair um 
and in their own personality, but all outgoing. Mm -hmm. I have seen it maybe other salons um, mm -hmm. where someone's kind of just quiet, cutting your hair, not really digging too deep in your personal life or not telling them about you personally. So I have seen it in other salons, but in my personal salon, you know, I feel like everyone is kind of outgoing in their own way. Okay. Now, as a hairstylist, um, how many days a week do you typically find that you have to work? Or, you know, can you tell me about how, how, how rigorous is the work schedule for a hairstylist? Hours, days? You know, that's the great thing about being a hairdresser because um, it's all up to you. I want to say if we're talking about a younger woman that's just getting out of cosmetology school, it's really important that they know that it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of long hours, a lot of work to become a hairdresser. A lot of girls think that they just go to hair school and they come out and get on the chair right away. Um, and 99% of the time, that's not true. So as a young hair, hairstylist getting out of school, you become an assistant first. So I know we work our assistants as much as possible. You get an hourly rate. You learn as much as you can being an assistant. Um, and then, you know, as a seasoned hairstylist, you can kind of make your own hours. I know, for example, one woman in my salon, she has two kids. She's married. Her husband just retired. So she works three days a week, maybe 25 hours. Um, and then me, who's a younger hairstylist, um, I work five days a week. Um, depending on what I have going on between 40 and 50 hours a week. So I'm, it's all up to, you know, the circumstances. You can kind of work um, less or more or however much you want to. It, it's, that's the beauty about being a hairdresser. Are salons openly, you know, flexible to allowing different hairstylists to do that? It depends on what, what hair salon, you know, you work in. There's all different kinds of hair salons from the $8 haircut salons, which I'll never recommend to anybody. Um, <laughs> or I've maybe a little bit higher salon, and then I call them the really smooth, smoothie salon. So it all depends. My personal boss and the, the woman that owns my salon, she is very flexible, but she has rules. She wants at least three stylists on a day. So we, among ourselves, have to make sure that I'm taking off. So, I, you know, can you come in that day and, and pick up that shift for me? Um, and then I know other salons. I go to New York, and it's mandatory for everyone to work um, th at least three days. So it depends. So as a new stylist, so someone out of school, you go to school, you come out, you're most likely going to start as an assistant from what I was hearing you say? Right. And as, assist as an assistant, I'm guessing they're going to work you to death? Well. <laughs> Pro probably. <laughs> well, you're not going to do, you know, you're not going to jump right behind the chair. That's okay. That's I feel like is is not what the cosmetology schools tell you. You know, you go to cosmetology school and you learn, and they teach you how to pass the state board. That's their job. Okay. They're teaching you all the different haircuts, how to formulate color. They're not teaching you all of that. So it's almost like being an apprentice. You know, you get into a salon, you're sweeping up hair, um, you know, shampooing, doing conditioning treatments, and learning as much as you can, watching the seasoned hairdressers do haircuts. And then, you know, for my salon, we have an assistant program. So, you know, you go through a certain program learning more and more and more. So, you know, like I said, it's always, it's all about education, especially when you're just an assistant. How do you bridge in that program an assistant who's doing hair washing and stuff like that over to where they're actually starting to do some of the things and you're letting them touch hair, coloring or putting foils or whatever it is they might be doing. How do you bridge that for them? And how long is that bridge process before, like you start as an, as an, you know, assistant, right? What does that bridge process look like? And how long am I going to have to do that before I'm actually allowed to like have a customer of my own? Right. 
I would say um, on average, you're looking at at least a year being an assistant. Some salons longer, um, but at least a year, you know, be, being an assistant. Go, I mean, my salon, other salons have some kind of training involved, and that is what's really key if you're if you're in cosmetology school and you're looking to get into a salon, is really try and find the salon that works best for you. You know, is it a salon that is a smaller salon? Is it a salon with only six stylists? Or is it a salon with 30 stylists? Um, is, is, the, is the salon providing continued education? Is it not providing it continued education? So when you're an assistant, that's when your time is to be picky and really get into a salon that you feel is right for you. So I would say, you know, you want to guarantee on at least a year becoming an assistant. And for my personal salon, you know, we're teaching you haircuts. You're working side by side with me. I'm throwing in foils. I'm letting you do the touch up in between. And then all of a sudden, it kind of just clicks one day. It's kind of like a hair miracle, I like to say. Because, you know, you find a lot of hairdressers like, I don't get it. I don't get it. These angles, how to hold your hands, where you stand how to formulate what color cancels out another color and all of a sudden it just clicks one day and that's when you're ready to be behind the chair. What's crazy is I'm surprised that I'm hearing that I'm not learning this in school. That's that's what I, I'm like, I would have thought that I spent two years or two and a half years in school that I would have learned this. So, But I, I guess it goes back to almost any type of school and you only learn certain things there and then when you come out, it's a whole different world, but yeah. what? Tell, talk to me more about school and what you really are taught, what you learn, what your what happens in school, so that people can truly understand what it is that they're getting into and what kind of homework or whatever whatever life is like in school and how long it is. Well, it's funny. I have one stylist at my salon that went through four years of college and then went to hair school. And she always says, cosmetology school was harder than college was. Mm. And that kind of stuck with me because, you know, it's not easy. I, I get girls all the time that are like, I just wanted something easy to get through school and start making money really fast. Right. And this is not the career to do it. Um, you, you almost, if you don't know the career, you, I could see somebody making a comparison between being a bartender and being a hairstylist. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, let me go to bartending school for three months, come out, and I can make drinks. Let me yeah. go to a cosmetology school, I'll learn how to hold a scissor, and I can make money there. But it's not the same. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so cosmetology <laughs> school is all about the testing. I mean, they really break it down. And, and when you go to cosmetology school, a lot of people don't realize that you are licensed to be an esthetician, which is skin care. Mm. Um, you can do hair and you can do nails and you can do makeup. So you're licensed in all of those areas. Now you can just go to school to be an esthetician, but you're not gonna be licensed in hair, makeup, and nails. So if you really aren't sure on what path that you wanna take, cosmetology would be the right thing to do because you could do different things with that. Also, cosmetology is going to mainly focus on hair though. I wanna say we spent two weeks on nails, two weeks on facials, and the rest is on hair. So, what's the rest time wise? Well, I most of the time you go full time is about 10 months, okay, 1200 hours to complete, um, to be able to go to your state board exam. So, that's normally Monday through Friday, nine to five, nine to four, something like that. So, so what, what do they teach you for nine months on hair? They teach you your body position, how to stand, how to hold the scissors, how to cut a straight line, um, how to set perm rods, how to set roller sets. I mean, they re how to do a basic um, color technique. Everything is very, very basic. So a basic haircut, basic technique, maybe a couple foils. You know, now we're into the fashion and ombre is in, which... I don't know if you know what that is, <laughs> but ombre is that lightness at the end of the hair where I ha would have red hair and it fades into oh, maybe a lighter red. I like that. Light blonde. So very fashion forward. I'm doing a lot of that. It's an amazing new trend that's in right now, but you're not going to learn that in hair school. Right. 
that's not a basic thing that you're going to learn. And that's when continued education comes in. Um, what Even when you're a seasoned hairdresser, all these trends keep coming out and you're like, wait a minute, how do I do ombre? So then you go to classes and you continue your education and learn how to do all of those new techniques that they come out with. Is there homework outside of cosmetology school that, like, when you go home, or are you done until you go back to class? <laughs> um, I think it depends. You know, normally we're talking about a nine-month period, so the first six months is a lot of book work. Um, I mean, you learn from nail diseases to hair diseases. You, you know, you learn different face shapes. You learn the bones that are in the head. So, I mean, you really go deep into, you know, you learn about electricity. I work with electricity every day. I'm not trying to get electrocuted, you know what I mean? So you learn a lot of things. Those six months book work, maybe doing written tests. What's and then the next six months would be more of a hands-on um, actually getting out mannequins and, and performing haircuts. Do they have, like, because I thought I heard... I've never gone to it myself, but where they'll have, you know, a, a salon teaching facility will have like days where the public comes in and allows somebody n new to cut their head. Exactly. You do that too? Yeah. And that's, and that's the clinical part of it. So, you know, that's, that's what I mean by maybe the first six months you're in a classroom sitting down, learning about um, all of those things, all of, you know, just the bones in the head is very important on how the hair leaves and all of that stuff. So learning very technical things and then getting onto the clinical floor and they bringing and you know people coming in for four dollar haircuts and you pushing their hairline back. <laughs> now, now you've been doing this for a little while. My, so my question is how much of that technical stuff that they taught you about the bones and, the, and all those other things do you think it really helps? Huge. He really? He, yeah. The, you know, the more professional you talk, um, talking about the occipital bone, or, you know, when you start to really know, when you know what you're talking about, and you're using the right terminology, and you are presenting yourself as a professional, then that's when everyone else is going to believe that you're a professional. We have people cutting, doing haircuts outside of their houses, right, that never even went to hair school. So that's why you pay them $5 and you pay me $30 for a haircut. So that's where the difference comes in is when you really know what you're doing and then you have someone that wishes they were a hairdresser just kind of doing it outside of their home. Okay, so the school is about 10 months. Is that pretty much the same almost no matter where you might go, or would it be different? Oh, every state is different, I think. Um, so the hours are different. Oh, the 1,200? 1,200 in New Jersey, you know, I think 1,400 in other places, maybe 1,000 other, other states. So it goes state by state. Now, you have to think about, I'm, I live in New Jersey, so if I wanted to go cut hair in Pennsylvania then I would need to get a Pennsylvania license. And how how difficult would that be to expand what you do in Jersey over into Pennsylvania? Because that's something I could see somebody saying, well, if I go through and I get a license here in New Jersey, what happens if I decide I want to move to California at some point? Right. How, do, how do I go about doing that? Every state is different. Um, you know, I, I believe, don't quote me on it, but Pennsylvania, Delaware, it's kind of you're just paying the state and you're getting another license. But I want to say maybe California, if, if any state has more required hours than what you already put in, then you actually have to go back and complete those extra hours. Even if you've been doing it for 10 years? Yeah. They don't just give you a test or say, no. They don't even retest you. It's just all about the hours. So even, you know, if you're going to cosmetology school... And it's all about the hours. So you're sick from Monday through Friday. You just lost out on those hours. So you were supposed to graduate in nine months. Well, now it's nine months plus one week because you have to make up those hours. So you're not going to complete cosmetology school until you do those 1,200 hours. So for me, who loves hair and love going to school, mm -hmm. I completed it in, in the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I had a girl that went to Pasatag school with me and she got pregnant. So she was out for six months. So she put it on hold, had her baby, and then could go back and complete the hours. So it's all up to the individual. I mean, how fast do you want to get through school? It's all about those hours and passing your test. And I'm guessing they also have like a part-time program too? They do. Most schools do, yeah. Um, you can go at night, which I want to say takes probably a, double the amount of time. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that nighttime schools may be like Monday through Thursday, 5 to 9, something like that. So it's going to take you longer, but, you know, there is other options than going full-time because full-time is, is a commitment for sure. So there's no way to become a hairstylist without having to go through a school like that, a formal school. Like you can't just get a job as a, as a, an assistant and kind of put in some hours and then eventually you can't, you got to get, you got to go through the school in order to get licensed. Yeah. Mm. You have to take the state board exam to get licensed. Now, girls that are in um, high school, some of them have no tech school. So you can go to hairdressing through high school too, do, hair, do high school and hairdressing, and that will take you four years to complete. You get out of high school and then you're 18 years old and you have a license to do hair. But that doesn't mean that they're going to, no salon is going to hire you as a hairdresser without putting in the work of becoming an assistant first. Hmm. And that's the key to becoming an excellent hairdresser. And some you know, I, I had a girl that say, I pay $20,000 to go to school. I'm not sweeping your hair. Well, I did it. <laughs> and look what happened. So, you know, it, that's what I mean about you're not, it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's mm-hmm. not going to come easy. Mm-hmm. So it all takes time and sacrifice, just like anything else in life. Hmm. Okay. So I was going to ask you, like what kind of money can hairstylists make, but it, I'm sure it varies all over the board and all over the country, and yeah, it depends on your clientele and just so varied, it's like ridiculous. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's very important because a lot of hairdressers are commission-based. I'm commission-based. So as an assistant, you get an hourly rate. Every salon is different, $8, 9 $10 an hour, um, plus tips. Assistants do get tips. Too. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a hairdresser, yeah, commission based. So, and that varies too. If you're right on the chair, you might get 35%. As you get up a little bit more, you know, a raise is now getting 40%, mm-hmm. 45%. And then, um, you know, normally you'll max out at 50%. Okay. Commission. That's good to know. So, the max someone should expect is really in the vicinity of about a 50% mark. Right. And then, of course, I've heard where people can, like, almost rent a chair. Yes, booth rental. Um, it is actually illegal in New Jersey. You cannot do that. In- <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, I don't know what state, actually, that, that you can do that in. But I know for sure that you can't do that in New Jersey. Why, why would that be illegal? I'll get back to you with that question. <laughs> I'm just, it just seems kind of silly to me. I mean, if you're well, like, yeah, I mean, I don't believe in booth rental and I'll tell you why is, you know, as a salon, you want teamwork, you want unity. So if I'm just throwing the owner, um, a hundred dollars a week or something like that, I don't care what the salon looks like. I don't care about her customers. I don't care about her. You know what I mean? So as a salon and as a unit, um, customer service is number one and um, you know I say hi to the stylist next to me her client she says hi to my client just the assistants keep it you know beautiful and spotless and clean cleaning up all the time so um, that's how you form a great teamwork too. yeah I can okay I can see that now what is it about cutting hair do you think that attracted you to it? Like, what is it about being a stylist that that you think gelled with you? Um, I feel like hair changes lives. Um, you know, 
you can just change people's lives right in your own hands. So I have a single mom, a newly single mom. Her husband just left her. She has two kids. She has this long, scraggly hair. We give her amazing, cute, sexy pixie cut, and she's walking out a brand new woman. And you help change her life that day. So I think that that is what you help rebuild her self-esteem, bring her back to who she is. And those moments where that client jumps out of your chair and hugs you and thanks you are the moments that I live for. So you have, as a hairdresser, more power than you think. Mm. And um, I'm huge personally into charity work. So um, a lot of hairdressers are very giving and love to be involved in charity. So all of those things kind of go hand in hand. So it just works well for me. And my boss loves me and kind of lets me have some control in what I want to do. So bringing charity events into the salon, doing cut and things like that just makes my whole world go around. So really having a strong connection with your owner, with your boss, with your manager, building that trust up. And letting and them letting you kind of explore and do your own thing is a very magical thing as well. So, don't just settle for any salon. Find the right salon for you. What is it about being a hairdresser that people should know that maybe it wouldn't be the right fit for them? Um. You are on your feet all day long, <laughs> which I think people don't really realize. I mean, people know that about hairdressers, um, but don't really realize how much hairdressing takes a toll on your body. I mean, we're being a hairdresser, the number one thing is we have to be fashion forward. So we have to stay up with the latest hair trends. I want to let you know that bangs are in this fall, so go and get yourself a fresh fringe, whether it's a side bang or a full bang. Um, but we have to be fashion forward. We have to know what's going on. So having your hair done, having your nails done, being, you know, dressed right, whether that's pumps or wedges or cute flats. I mean, we're all about fashion and, and um, we're in that beauty industry. So we have to stay up on that. So I know when you're first starting out as an assistant, you're not making that much money. The stylists are buying Michael Kors watch and you can't afford them. So that's where the sacrifice comes in and that's where the determination comes in. So, you know, I love that part about it and I love getting dressed up every day. Um, so all of that matters when you're, when you're looking at becoming a hairdresser. If you're looking to just kind of, if you're the type that could see yourself sitting behind the computer and typing all day, hairdressing is not for you. Hmm. Okay. Now, you were kind enough to send me over your resume, which gave me a lot of insight as to uh, things you've done. And I was just uh, very surprised, I guess, that in relatively a short period of time, it's like you've gone through a tremendous amount of education and training things. Um, You've increased, you know, different things by very large percentages. Um, it looks like you've only worked really at a, at a couple different places, which I thought was good. It wasn't like you were hopping around and so forth. And we will put the resume up so that people can just get an idea. I, I didn't want to put it up so they could just necessarily get an idea of you, but also of what a resume of someone who loves what they're doing um, is actually doing to yeah. to to build that career right um because uh, i i see just this ted gibson's advanced academy technique you know that you just did in july and i know we're only in october of 2013 but that was recently and so forth how many different training things and or let's say how often in the course of a year how often do you think that you're going to these things don't tell me all the time <laughs> um, well let me tell you that mandatory um, in our salon you have to do two advanced education a year to keep your job at the salon that I work in um, I want to say last year I did 14 um, different <laughs> 
classes and academies. Um, but, you know, I never wanted to be that average behind the chair hairdresser. So I never saw that for myself. So continuing education is the only way that I know how to become better and how to grow yourself and your talent. So that's why I'm so committed to continuing education. And, you know, I don't see myself being um, just behind the chair forever. I'm Right now I'm going through an interview with Matrix, which is a huge color line. It's the um, color line and the product that we sell at the salon. Um, and that's actually what I made that resume for. So it's actually a waiting game right now to see if I get a job offer or not. Um, so that's my newest exciting adventure that I have going on. And, um, you know, I can't stress it enough that if you are someone that just wants to get through school and just cut hair, you're never going to make it. You have to have a passion, a love for this industry um, and know that your job's never done. So what would this next job give you the ability to do? I would become one of matrix educators. So just like any other job, just like coming into a salon, I will start at the bottom and I will go around locally and teach schools and um, other salons about matrix and their products and their color line. Um, and so I'll start there. And then you, as you work your way up, um, you can end up being the artistic director of Matrix, which is the top of the top, which when you go to these hair shows, it's almost like a fashion show, but it's for hair. And they're on stage and they're creating these amazing haircuts and colors, and they are the top um, educational director for Matrix. And that is my dream to be, to work my way up to that, to being on the main stage teaching thousands of other hairdressers. Um, different techniques like that. Now, why do you want to do that as opposed to continuing as a stylist? I don't think that I'll ever stop being a stylist. So okay. I don't want to say, I don't want to say that, that I will, I'll never stop being behind the chair. Mm -hmm. um, I love the personal interaction that I have with my clients and, and like I said, growing with them um, through the years and things that they're going through, things that I'm going through, I would never give up being behind the chair. Um, how do you? How would you do that and be working for Matrix? In the beginning, it would probably I would probably only work for Matrix. Most salons are closed on Sundays and Mondays, except for like the big chains and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I know when in my salon, when we have educators come in and teach us, it's on our days off. Oh, so going around on Sundays and Mondays. Um, would be when I would work for Matrix. Oh, so okay. I could necessarily, I mean, I could still keep um, working full-time at the salon and then working with Matrix, and I would be working seven days a week and be exhausted. <laughs> it's all right. It's not going to kill anybody. Um, now, I saw you said something responsible in one of your uh, listings where you're currently working. It says responsible for 80% of monthly salon product sales. Does that mean out of all the sales that were sold for, for salon products, you were doing 80% of them? Yeah. Yeah. And what do you attribute that to? Just pushing them or what? How did, how did you get to that status out of all the people working there that you alone were doing 80%? Um. I think that that's a special technique that you either have or you don't have. It's kind of, my boss always makes fun of me and is like, why are you, aren't you like selling insurance or something? You're such a saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> but I love what I do and I love my clients and I love the, the work that I do on my clients' hair. So I want them to be able to recreate what I created in the salon. And the only way that they can do that is by having the products that I use. Um, in their hair. That is so, such a good answer. <laughs> so, I mean, and to go back, um, that's what a lot of young um, women don't understand that are coming into be wanting to become a stylist. 
that's all the things that you have to learn. It's not all about technical performance on the hair, the coloring and the cutting. It's about how are you going to get clients. I remember the first week that I was on the chair from assistant to stylist, I worked 40 hours a week and made $100. Because you're transitioning from an hourly rate to commission. I didn't have any clients. So what are you going to do to get clients? I walked around door to door to door passing out flyers, going to Wawa, stopping women and saying, I love your hair. I would love to do your hair. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. So even when you get that chair, how are you going to get clients to fill that chair? You don't just take them like round robin coming in the door or they're almost, depending upon the salon, that might not be possible. Exactly. Most salons, like the salon that I work in and the, you know, the salon that you're paying decent money for, um, do not have a lot of walk-in. It's by appointment. So, yeah, if you want, you know, one of my first jobs was best cuts. So, I was doing men's cuts in and out all day long. And that's not what I wanted to do. But I got good at doing men's cuts. But that's not what I wanted to do. I was getting $3 tips, $17 haircuts. I was not making any money. So to now transition to a $23 haircut for a man um, and they're rebooking with you and they care about their hair and they're buying product from you and they're tipping you now $15, $10 um, and coming in every four weeks to see you. I feel like a cheapskate now. Yeah. How much do you tip your hairdresser? Let's talk about that. <laughs> I usually tip about $5 for uh, like a $17 cut. Okay. But so I feel cheap. I feel like a cheapskate now. <laughs> now you don't have to. But um, I also see something that I didn't know what it was. You said interpret creative briefs from clients. What does that mean? That's a fancy way of saying consultation. Oh, okay. <laughs> So a woman comes, and this is all something that you have to learn how to do. You know, you have a woman that comes in and is blonde, and she's like, I don't want any brass in my hair. I see orange in my hair. I see red in my hair. And you're like, what? Red? This is red. So it's all about trying to figure out exactly what the client is saying, interpreting what they're saying, and making sure that you're speaking English and they're speaking English, and you're both on the same page. So you don't have any unhappy clients. And that's a task within itself. Where do you learn that? Because I'm gathering they don't teach you that in the school. Working with other seasoned hair, hairdressers. That's why being coming an assistant is so important. You're hearing how, mm. oh, she talks this way to her clients. This is what she uses as examples. This is how she explains things to them. And then goes, this is how the other stylist talks. This is what they say. So being around other hairdressers that are successful and learning from them is all about sitting back and watching how they cut hair, how they color hair, how they talk to their clients, how they get referrals, how they sell products. Um, it's a whole lot more than just cutting hair. And mm. that's what I would love for everyone to know. It's, you know, my sisters always say, you have such a fun job. I do have a fun job. I love my job. But it's a lot of work, too. <laughs> right. Not easy. And I think over time that they have witnessed that, too. And they're like, hairdressers really have to be hustlers. They really have to be out there promoting themselves. They need to have always have cards on them. And you need to look like a hairdresser. I mean, everywhere I go, people are always like, I love your hair color. I love your hair. I love your nails. And that's what you want. You want to look like a hairdresser, not like you're going to the gym. Unless now, you're now, since you can't cut your own hair and color your own hair. I wish. What What do you mean you wish? I wish if I could take my head off my body, there, yeah. I would do tons of stuff to this. So <laughs> how, who do you trust type of thing? Not, not specifically the person's name, but right. in other words, how do you select who's going to do your hair to represent you right. type of thing? Um, you know, me personally, whoever really has time in the salon, it goes to say, um, if your hair looks a mess, then you're really busy in the salon, right? Because you don't have time to get your hair done. So believe me, I go with like 
six inch roots all the time. Um, and then I end up going in on my day off. But you, I mean, just having a conversation with the other stylist, really anyone in my salon can do my hair. I used to have a short haircut, so I only let the owner cut it when it was shorter. Um, but it's all about, it's, you know, anyone can put color on, right? Anybody can put foils on. You learn all that in school. You learn how to, everyone can do a foil, everyone can put color on. The difficult part about it is formulating. The formulation of what color you mix together. So normally I mix up all my own color and say, can you put this on for me? Oh, okay. Now I got it. That so, so that's, you know, that's the most. You know, you learn how to do all of that, doing root touch-ups, doing foils, doing all of that. Anyone can do that. Over time, you learn how to do that. The hard part about coloring hair is the formulation part. So if you're going to hair school, make sure that you know the color wheel, like the back of your hand, because you're going to need it. Now, but your hairstyle, the cut, is very styled. I mean, it's not like it's just all one length and just cut at the bottom. So that also looks like it would take some finesse and some expertise beyond just a cut that, 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 that type of thing. Yeah. And that all comes, you know, with time It all. You're not going to just, and that's, you know, when you see my resume, you're like, okay, she did this and she did that and she did that. You're not going to ever learn everything and you're never going to know everything. And that's the beauty about hairdressing. It never gets boring because there's always someone better than you, someone that you can learn from, and someone that's coming up with new techniques or you're coming up with new techniques. And, um, and so your job never gets boring. You always, you know, have to be willing to push yourself to the next level, whether it's different kind of curling irons that's coming out or different kind of braids. Braids are huge right now. Or, um, you know, my bangs just aren't cut straight across. They have a, an angle to them. So how do you do that? So it's all, you know, it's all just, more than what you think it is. Right, right. Now, do you, as a stylist, not you necessarily, but as a typical stylist, are you responsible for buying your own products, your own hardware, and things like that that you work with, or does a salon usually give it to you? Um, well, it depends on what you're talking about. So let's talk about products that you use on your station to sell. My salon, we do not have to pay for them. Um, you know, obviously, I sell a lot of products, so I can really pull anything that I need or want off of the shelf, and I have to think twice about it because I bring a lot of money in selling products. But maybe the stylist that's next to me does not sell as many products, so she can't pull as many products off the shelf, if that mm. makes sense. Yes, right? it does. Um, so then she just steals my product. I got you. <laughs> um, and so, cheers. And blow dryers and clippers. Now that's all on you. Mm -hmm. That those are all your tools. Um, I really want a new pair of shears, and the ones that I want are about six hundred dollars, and they're stainless steel, and they never go dull. So I'll probably have them for at least ten years. Um, but the shears that I'm using now are about three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So. It's all an investment. It's all sacrifice. The shears that you get in cosmetology school will not be okay when you're cutting real people's hair. Um, mannequins do a number on your shears. So, you know, you get those shears in school and they're your practice shears and then be prepared to pay a couple hundred dollars for some nice shears when you get out. But all of that is up to you keeping on top of um, blow dryers and curling irons and all of those kinds of things are are put on the stylus for the most part. And what about when you want to go to training lo things, training events? Are they free? Do you, if there's a fee to go, do you pay? Does the salon pay? How does that work typically? I think that it, it you know, all salons are different. Um, my salon, we actually have a competition in my salon, and it's about retail sales. So whoever sells the most, Whoever sells the most retail gets fifty dollars put into their account towards education. Fifty um, is that like per month or something or eight months, yeah. Um so it kinda all depends on, on where you work and what you do. So, you know, it's it's so hard because I get it here, you know, we're young, we wanna have all these nice things and then here comes a class for hundred and thirty dollars. 
So that's what I mean about the sacrifice all comes in. Do I want to go and buy a new watch or do I want to invest in myself and invest in my career and, and learn something new? Um, so that's what's important. So I mean, like I went to the Ted Gibson Advanced Academy, which was the most amazing thing that I've done in my career so far. And just to take that class was $800. Really? Um, so I was excited about it. I wanted to go. I met him a couple of times when I went to Orlando and, play, and to different places. So going to my boss and telling her that I wanted that, she said, you know what? I'll give you $200 towards that. So she didn't have to do that. Um, but she believed in me and believed in my passion. So that's, you know, another important thing is to get in with your boss, like your boss, make sure you guys are on the same page, um, and, you know, prove yourself to her and the, or him, and in return that they will really help you out, especially if you're making money for them. They are going to want to invest in you and, and um, make you happy. Aren't they fearful that you'll just leave or because I, I could see that happening. Yeah. I mean, um, for the most part, any salon that you work in, you are going to have to sign a contract. So I signed a contract that, um, don't quote me, that I can't work. If I quit or get fired, I can't work anywhere around the salon eight miles, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So if, For how long? Um, like Six months? Okay. Six months. So all, any, con, any salon can make up their own contract, and all of that can be adjusted. Um, but 99% of the time you are, as a stylist, going to have to sign a contract. As an assistant, do not sign any contract. And you shouldn't have to. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so obviously... You know, I could pick up and go to the next salon down the street and take all of my clients with me. But that contract is kind of a nudge in there that's saying, well, you can't go down the street, but you can go... Eight miles away. Eight miles away, and your clients probably aren't going to follow you. And that's kind of a way that the salon can kind of protect that. But if you're a really great stylist, they'll follow you. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but it's all... But that's why I, I have been stressing that as an assistant, as a newbie into the industry, find a salon that works for you because you don't want to be a salon hopper. You know, you want to get into a salon, commit to that salon, become a part of their team, and really grow in that salon. And that's how you build trust with your owner. That's when they're going to invest in you, help you obtain your goals. I mean, my boss is really amazing, and she's supporting all of my matrix um, auditions that I do and, and everything that I want to do. So she could have easily been like, no, I want you to be in the salon. But she gets me my goals, so she supports all of that. So that's really important to me. That sounds great. Now to wrap everything up, because I think we covered a lot of good stuff and I, uh, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. I'd like to end it by just asking you if realizing that this, you know, interview could be seen by, you know, any number of people interested in doing this. What final words, what, what advice, somebody out there who might be anywhere from maybe 9 or 10, 12, 15, 18, 25, 40, thinking of becoming a stylist, what final thoughts, like what would you want to give them as a few words of wisdom, like think about this or do this or make sure you do that? Where would you like to end it and give them some final words of thought? Um, my first thing that I would love to stress is hairdressing is probably the best industry to work in. Um, so if you are that little girl that's cutting all your Barbie hair off or loves playing with makeup and loves fashion and all of that, dive right in. You won't be sorry. Um, and the great thing about being a hairdresser is, you know, you're not boxed into just being behind the chair. Being a hairdresser, you have so many options. You know, you can travel to New York and and work for the best of the best, or you can stay in your hometown and work for your little mom and pop shop, 
or you can go work for um, a school, you can go do hair in Hollywood. I mean, the, the possibilities are absolutely endless as long as you're willing to make the sacrifice, be passionate, and, and love what you do. I mean, you can really go anywhere in this industry. So find the right school for you, find the right salon for you, learn as much as possible, and remember to always continue your education because there's always something new to learn. That's great. Jennifer, thank you very, very much. Thank you. And I wish you all the best with your upcoming Matrix uh, position. Thank you so much. And uh, again, if uh, anyone would like to uh, get more information about the interview, we'll be putting up your resume and some contact information and some links to your Facebook and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, please visit the website to get more information about this interview from Jennifer as well as others. And uh, we wish you again the best of luck and thank you again. Bye-bye.